Hi, Greyhounds. Alrighty, we're back to Saving Winslow. I hope that you like the first part. We're going to read chapters 10 through 15 today. I hope he's able to save him. I hope that um, Nora will somehow accept him. Oh my goodness. Here we go. Chapter 10. Freeze that scene is the name of this chapter. One time in the middle of summer, a year or two earlier, Louis was walking down the road on his way into town. He stopped near a batch of tall sunflowers blooming beside a white fence. It seemed like a painting to him, those bold golden sunflowers against that white fence and overhead a pure blue sky with white, white clouds drifting along. Louis wished he could freeze that scene. Then, as he stood there perfectly still, a bird floated down and landed on one stalk. The bird was a deeper blue than the sky. What shape was that? Instantly, the name Indigo Bunting came to his mind. He must have seen a bird by that name in a book, but he couldn't think when or where that might have been. And now the scene appeared even more perfect to him, an indigo bunting atop a golden sunflower beside a white fence beneath the blue sky with drifting white clouds. He felt supremely happy standing there. On he went into town to buy bread and milk. Before he reached the store, he passed the small park, and on one bench near the walkway lay a disheveled, thin man in a tattered army jacket. He appeared to be asleep. One arm was across his chest, and the other hung low to the ground. The man was unshaven, his hair long and straggly, his clothes filthy. Would I want to freeze this scene, Louis wondered? This scene of the unkempt thin man in a tattered army jacket on the brown wooden bench on the green grass near the gray walkway? As Louis moved on, he thought he didn't have a choice. The scene, for whatever reason, was already frozen in his mind. On his way back home, Louis slid a small brown bag next to the bench. In the bag were two rolls and a candy bar. Aw, that seems really touching to me, because if he's going to remember the happy moments that are ingrained in his brain forever and his heart forever, he's making a choice. He has to remember this scene right here, and he chooses to help out the man. It seems to me like Louis has a kind heart, don't you think? He seems really compassionate. Okay, back to our story. It was odd, Louis thought. Now, as he held Winslow trembling in his arms, the smell of milk formula on his face, it was odd that what floated into his mind were both scenes, the indigo bunting atop a golden sunflower beneath the blue sky and the thin man on a park bench. Winslow's ears brushed against Louis's cheek. This scene, Louis thought, will stay in my mind. Little gray donkey in my arms trying to stay alive. Chapter 11, What's a Winslow? One morning, when the snow lay deep and white on the ground and the sun shone overhead, Louis wrapped Winslow in a blanket and took him outside, settling on the front porch. Winslow became alert, turning his small head this way and that, eyes blinking against the bright light. He put his narrow face up to Louis and nibbled at his scarf. Bah, bah, he murmured. Bah, bah, bah. It made Louis laugh. It was the first time the donkey had managed that sound. Up until then, his whimpers had always sounded like, please, please. Do you think you're a lamb, Winslow? Are you going to bow like one? You're supposed to say, hee-haw. Winslow chomped on Louis's scarf, pulling strands loose. Louis was rubbing his face against Winslow's when someone said, hey, Nora was standing on the sidewalk in her large black coat and her clunky black boots. On her head was a bright yellow knitted hat pulled low over her ears. Nora had big black eyes and black hair that poked out beneath the hat at peculiar angles. She looked rather like a bumblebee, Louis thought. What are you doing with that thing? Nora asked. What thing? You mean Winslow? What's a Winslow? That's his name, Winslow. He's a donkey and his name is Winslow. The one that's going to die? He's not going to die. Don't be sure. Nora took a couple steps toward the porch, tentative steps, as if she expected something to jump out at her or scold her and send her away. Want to hold him? Nah, why would I want to do that? Because he's really soft. Nah. Eh, bah, bah. Oh, Nora said, it makes a noise. She had smiled automatically, but then caught herself and removed her smile. Winslow raised his nose in the air, smelling the air around the visitor. Within a blanket, his legs pedaled. He's squiggling, Nora observed. 
I think he wants to get down on the ground, but I don't know. It might be too cold for him. Nora was now standing at the bottom of the porch steps. You could try, maybe. You could set him down on the shoveled part and see what happens. Maybe, if you want, or not. Louis unwrapped the blanket and set Spindly Winslow down. He wobbled, his long legs bending this way and that until he managed to stand upright. Winslow turned toward Nora and took two steps, stopped, tottered, and then stumbled the rest of the way. He leaned against her, nudging her boots until Nora leaned down and patted Winslow's head. I think he likes you, Louis said. Nah, nah. She patted Winslow again. You think? Nah, donkeys just do that. I bet stumble at anybody. Maybe. Well, I gotta go. Here, you better wrap him up again. You know what I bet? What? I bet you could let him run around inside the house. I mean, like upstairs instead of the basement. If you put diapers on him. Louis winced. Diapers? Yeah. I heard about some lady who did that with a lamb, you know, so it doesn't stink up your house and make a mess. Diapers? Yeah, diapers. I gotta go. Louis watched her leave in her big black coat and boots and that bright yellow hat. Do you think it's possible Nora is starting to care about Winslow? I think so. Maybe she thinks he's not going to die now and she has suggestions for taking care of him. Okay, chapter 12. Here comes trouble. The rumble of Uncle Pete's old blue truck announced his arrival. Uncle Pete was a large man, tall and stout, with mammoth hands and feet. His normal greeting was a booming, hey there, followed by a pat on the shoulder. But the pat was so forceful, it usually knocked Louie off balance. Hey there, Louie. Whoa, careful there. Don't fall over. You need some meat on those bones, boy. Uncle Pete was a childhood friend of Louie's father. Not really an uncle, but that's how Louie's parents had always referred to him. Here comes trouble, Louie's mother said. That's what she usually said when she saw Uncle Pete. Ha, that's me. Trouble is my middle name. His cheeks were red from the cold. Wicked out there today. How's that poor donkey doing? Did it croak on you? It was doing good until this morning, Louis said. Come and see. Louis had fed Winslow late that night Mr. before, Herbert, and the two of them the had settled down to sleep, Winslow in a small pen and Louis on the nearby cot. Usually the donkey woke him up around 4 a.m. for another feeding, but Louis had slept soundly through the night without hearing Winslow. When Louis did wake, it was almost 7 o'clock, and he felt relieved. Now maybe Winslow would continue to sleep through the night. For the past week, Louis had been groggy all day long, never fully feeling fully awake, always feeling as if he could fall asleep sitting up. When he opened the pen, Winslow did not scramble to his feet or turn his head toward Louis as he usually did. He made no sound, no please, no bass. He was lying on his side, his breathing shallow. When Louis lifted him, Winslow slumped in his arms, still not waking. Louis rubbed his sides with a blanket and dipped a cool cloth against his face. Oh, Winslow, come on. What's the matter? What's wrong? Louis tried to recall if he had done anything wrong, if he had mixed the formula incorrectly, or if the bottle had not been clean, but he could not think of anything he had done differently the night before. He summoned his parents and ran next door to get Mac's father, who was not a vet, but he knew about animals. Mac's father said, some kind of infection probably, need to have a vet check him, get some antibiotics in him. Did I do something wrong? Louis asked. He hugged Winslow to his chest, stroking his head. Newborns are fragile, Max's father said. They can catch any old thing drifting through the air. It's a wonder any of them make it. Max's father called a good friend of his, a retired veterinarian, who came over right away. After examining Winslow, the vet gave him two shots and left a prescription for additional medicines. It's okay, boy, the vet said to Louis. He might make it, but if he doesn't, you're doing as much as you can. These things happen. You can do everything right, and yet... His unfinished sentence hung in the air. Before leaving, the vet said, You'll have to give him one of those shots, eat these shots, each day for at least ten days. Poor Winslow. What? Who? Me? Louis said. I'll show you how. My grandson can do it, and he's only nine. Give a shot? You want me to give a shot? Watch. He showed Louis how to fill the syringe, check the level, tap it to release air bubbles, insert the needle, and release the medication. Practice on an orange. You'll be fine. But, but, you can do it. Oh, doesn't that seem like a lot of responsibility for someone Louis's age to have to give shots to his donkey who is so ill? Oh, goodness. 
By the time Uncle Pete arrived later that day, Winslow was a little more alert. He had taken a few ounces of milk and had opened his eyes, but he still had not stood and was still breathing shallowly. Uncle Pete touched Winslow gently, his huge hand, huge hand enveloping the donkey's body. Yep, he said, he's a sick one. Too bad. Kind of amazing you got him to live this long, though. Aw, sounds like he thinks he's going to die. Like, hey, good job, kid. He's going to die. But he's going to make it, Louis, Louis said. Well, his mother didn't make it. My LGD died yesterday. That birth must have been harder on her than I thought. But Winslow will make it, Louis insisted. He will. He will. Later that day, Louis remembered that Gus had once told him that LGD meant little gray donkey. Winslow, you are my LGD and you're going to make it, right? Oh, I hope so. Chapter 13, what's the matter with him? Oh my goodness, that's the name of the chapter. I don't really like the name of that chapter. Louis, you awake? That girl is out front, his mother said. Louis was lying on the couch with Winslow wrapped in a blanket on his chest. Which girl? You know, the one you call the bumblebee girl. Oh, Nora, what's she doing? Walking back and forth. I think maybe she wants to come in or something. You better see for yourself. I'd probably scare her off. Louis carried Winslow to the door. Sure enough, there was Nora walking back and forth on the sidewalk in front of his house. Hey, he called to her. Did you come to see Winslow? I was just nearby, she said. Well, do you want to see him? Not really. No, maybe. You got him there in that blanket. Come on in, Louis said. I can't bring him out today, but you can come in if you want. Nora glanced up the street and down the street and kicked the snowbank with her foot. She did. She was wearing her usual outfit, and Louis realized he did not have a very good idea what she really looked like because she was always swallowed up in that big coat, and her hat was squished all the way down on her head. He didn't know if she was plump or skinny or if she had long hair or short. She came slowly up the walk, as if making up her mind whether she was going to come in or not. Louis opened the door wider. Come on, he said. Can't leave the door open. Might get Winslow cold. Okay, then, Nora said, stepping inside. She stomped the snow off her boots and casually tried to peer over the edge of the blanket-wrapped bundle in Louis's arms. What's the matter with him? Something's the matter, isn't it? I can tell. He's all saggy. He's been sick. I knew it. What? I just knew it. Nora stomped one foot hard on the floor. It makes me so mad. I don't want to see it. I knew it. Wait. I gotta go. I gotta. I just knew it. And with that, Nora left, stomping her boots all the way down the walk and down the street. <sighs> Sounds like Nora's had, had her share of sadness and disappointment. <sighs> she got her hopes up and she just thinks that Winslow's not going to make it. What do you think? You think he's going to make it? I sure hope so. Chapter 14. See that light? One time when Louis was young, maybe three or four, he woke in the middle of the night and saw that the sky outside his window was silvery white, so bright. Through the window streamed a rectangle of light, a wide beam across the room. It fell across the foot of his bed and onto the floor. He thought he was in a different world, maybe one where the sun shone silver. Maybe it was day or not night. Louis went to... Louis went to the window and saw the silvery light spread across the whole sky. The trees cast long, dark shadows across the lawn. He walked through the house, peering out other windows, and everywhere was the silver sky, and everywhere the dark shadows. He woke Gus. Something's happening. See that light? It's only moonlight, Gus said. There's a full moon tonight. Gus led Louis to the other side of the house, and there from a bathroom window above the roof of the neighbor's house was a full moon. Full moon was suspended in the sky. See, Gus said, nothing to worry about, nothing unusual. When he returned to his bed, Louis thought, nothing unusual? That silver light is not usual? Then why'd he never seen it before? Why'd the light wake him? Chapter 15, Shots. The first time Louis gave Winslow a shot, he almost fainted. He kept telling himself, I can do this, I can do this. But he didn't truly believe it. He was afraid of getting it wrong and hurting Winslow. He could hardly bear it that Winslow was sick, but it would be even worse if he hurt him more. His father held Winslow while Louis prepared the syringe. For a moment, Louis felt dizzy and queasy. He thought he might vomit as he injected, injected the needle and released the medication. Winslow briefly twitched, but he made no sound. Did I do it? Louis asked his father. I did it, didn't I? He gently massaged the area around the injection site and held Winslow close. You sound surprised, his father said. Well, I am, surprised and relieved. Me too, his father said, surprised and relieved. 
I thought I was going to throw up. Me too. I thought we both were going to throw up. The next night time, he had to give Winslow a shot. He tried to convince his father to do it, but his father said, no, you're taking care of him. You can do it. That time when Louis inserted the needle into the pinch of skin as he'd been directed, the needle went through to the other side and the medicine shot into the air. Louis wanted to throw the syringe on the ground and shout, I can't do this. I can't, I can't, I can't. But one look at pitiful Winslow made him try again. This time the needle went into the muscle instead of into the layer just beneath the skin. Winslow yelped and Louis cried. Oh, I'm sorry, Winslow. I don't want to hurt you. I can't do this. I can't make you better. Louis felt helpless. He imagined himself in the incubator when he was born. Was he pinched and poked and prodded? Was it hard to get a needle or a tube into him? Did he cry? Did the doctors and nurses feel helpless? Did his parents cry? There was a lump in the muscle where Louis had misdirected the shot, and Winslow flinched when Louis rubbed it. The next shots were easier, but Winslow was slow to respond to the medicine. Why did he get better right away? It takes time for the medicine to work, Louis's father said. But what if it doesn't work? Louis wanted Winslow to get better immediately. He hated not knowing if he was helping or hurting Winslow. He hated not knowing if Winslow would survive. Sometimes Louis felt that saving Winslow would also save and protect Gus, like the two were connected somehow. One day, Mac and Claudine appeared at the door calling out for Louis. They were surprised when Louis answered the door to see Winslow making his wobbly way down the hall behind him. Unsteady, but at least he's walking, Mac said. Aw, Claudine said, diapers. It was true, a donkey with diapers. Inside the house, upstairs, not in the basement. I know it's weird, Louis said, but whenever I come upstairs from the basement, he looks so sad and bumps his head against the steps over and over. Claudine put her hand on Louis's arm. But you have to, you know, you have to change the diapers. Yes, it's not my favorite job. I also have to give him shots. Shots? You know how to do that? Still learning. Claudine stroked Winslow's head. Will he make it? He'll make it, Louis said. He will. Claudine tilted her head sympathetically. I guess I wouldn't get too attached, though, if it were me. I mean, I would be so, so upset if you know if... Louis interrupted her. Hey, where's Nora? Claudine patted Louis's arm. Oh, she didn't want to... You know. What? You know what? We should leave, Mac, right? Don't you have to do that thing at the... Mac blinked a few times and said, Oh, sure, better go. See you, Louis. Talk to you later. Louis watched them head toward Mac's house next door. Claudine was in front and Mac behind her as they followed the narrow shovel, shoveled path. The way Mac followed Claudine reminded Louis of Winslow trailing behind him all day long. And that's the end of our reading through chapter 15 today. I'm glad that Winslow's starting to get better. Sounds like Noor doesn't want to see him. She's afraid of him dying. I wonder if they've had, if they've had a situation where they really hoped for something and it didn't turn out. I'm so glad that Louis has not given up hope and is stuck by Winslow. Would you be able to change his diapers like that? Give him a shot? I want to know what you think. What do you think about it? Um, would you be able to give him shots? What are you reading? I would love to hear from you. It makes my day when I get an email from one of you. Take care, everyone, and I hope you have a great day, and I can't wait to see you soon. Bye.